overcome the pressures of the world that, that, the, that the world applies to his children. Remember that he gives us courage. And, and that we talked about the pressure that, that what it looks like to turn from God's will. And, and then there's also, we looked at why is there pressure? And we looked at all the different things of, you know, here are, are the faithful ones, you know, such as Dr. Luke and, and all of these different people that were following Paul around. And here they are advising Paul and saying, don't go back to Jerusalem. It's just, we know that something bad is going to happen. So just don't go. And, and so they were looking out for his well-being it was it was kindness that led them to that but you wonder how many of them were actually praying for God's will to be done and then to look to see hey are, are, are we truly seeking God's will in this in response when they were like no Paul don't go um, it was really, really cool to see how Paul was looking to withstand that type pressure. And, and we know what withstanding that type pressure looks like, right? It, it looks as, as we uh, looked at life similar to Christ. That's how we can overcome that type of pressure. We also know that we refuse what it looks like to be swayed from God's revealed will. So again, remembering the revealed will that came to Paul was he knew that it was what God wanted him to do to go back to Jerusalem. And so if he knows that in his heart of hearts that he is to go back to Jerusalem, nothing's going to sway him. He was a dog with a bone going after what God had called him to do. And so he knew what it looked like to withstand pressure. He also was not a man pleaser. So anytime a man would share something with him, he would listen, but he's going to ultimately go with what God's will is for him. And Paul trusted God's sovereignty no matter what. And those are all things that we ourselves can take to heart and know the truth that comes with knowing and pursuing God's will for our lives. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we dive into the rest of chapter 21. Father, we, uh, we thank you for this time that we're able to uh, enjoy with one another as we study your word. Father, we, we know that the world applies pressure. We know what the world has to offer us. And sometimes, Lord, it looks pretty enticing. But God, we know that what it takes to withstand that type of pressure is pursuing you. So Lord, may we approach life just like Christ did and, and not be swayed from what your will is for our lives. May we trust you in all things. And we pray that you would speak to our hearts here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we are, we're in Acts chapter 21. Look at it, verses 17 to 40. So feel free and turn there uh, with us. And as we're doing that together, uh, we're going to be looking at what a, a dangerous heart looks like. And it's, uh, it's something that comes about when we're looking for certain um, responses from what, uh, what the, the world has to offer. But our, our theme this morning is this. A heart for Christ is moved with a burning love for others to know Jesus. I'll say that again. A heart for Christ is moved with a burning love for others to know Jesus. There was a, a coach of uh, Georgetown uh, and football, which you don't hear about Georgetown football very often. You hear, you hear more about Georgetown uh, uh, basketball. But back in the, in the day, there was a coach by the name of Coach Little. And uh, Coach Little had this, uh, this type of uh, student that, that he just... He, he just he, he looked at him and was like, there's something special about this kid. Now, he was just an average football player, but, but he noticed something about him that, that made him special. So Coach Little was, um, was getting ready, and, and, and they're preparing for this game. And um, after there was this real big game that had taken place, uh, he, what, what really approached him before that game took place, it's what really uh, stood out to him about this player was he, he would see him on occasion on campus with his father, and they were always linked arms together. And he always thought that was so special to see uh, a player and, uh, and, his, and his father to just be linked arms as they were walking around campus. It wasn't very often as when his father was there to visit. And so after this one big game, uh, the coach uh, received a phone call from the student's mother, and they found out that his father, the one who he's linked arms with, had passed away of a heart attack. 
And the, the student was heartbroken at the time. And uh, so he went home to a few days and for the funeral and, and uh, all that time to just, to just be brokenhearted and, and to cherish the time with family. When the student returned home from that time of playing, uh, from that time with family, he looked at coach, and again, this is just an average regular football player, didn't play very much, and he said, coach, can you please let me play? I want to play. And the coach agreed, knowing the terms that he had been walking through. He agreed. He said, yeah, I'll let you play a few plays. The game came up, and the coach played him the entire game, all 60 minutes. He played him all 60 minutes because that player played the best he had ever played in his entire life. He ran and blocked like an All-American. that he, The coach had never seen him play like this before. The game gets over and he goes, what's gotten into you? He said, you know how my father and I would walk arm in arm around campus? He said, yeah. He said, my father was blind. And now this is the first time he's ever seen me play. His desire to please someone he loved, someone not visibly present, made all the difference. You see, that type of response is the very response I see that Paul has. Because that non-visible presence of the Holy Spirit is with Paul, and he knew it. And so he was going to do everything possible to be the example of what it looks like to follow God's will. And now, we are talking this morning about what a dangerous heart is. Now, I'm not talking about dangerous in, uh, in worldly terms. I'm talking about eternal. Because a man who has a passion and heart for God's will and God's will alone is going to do all kinds of wonders in this world. We do know Paul wasn't perfect. He made mistakes. And, but we do know what his devoted heart to Christ looked like. He was determined because the salvation of God's people was his goal. When Paul looked at God's people, the, their salvation, that is the goal. He had a desire for others. He was always engaged with the Jewish culture. And here he is getting ready to go back to Jerusalem. What we're talking about this morning is when Paul arrives in Jerusalem. And how, remember Philip's, Philip's four daughters are now telling him, they're like, listen, you're going to go and trouble is going to come. And he's like, okay. Okay. This, this, is, this is what God wants me to do. And so here he is willing to take risks for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. Here he is, willing to take risks for the name of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what a dangerous heart looks like. So here we are in, in the first point here is, is Paul's reception. What takes place when Paul is received in verses 17 to, to the very beginning of 20? So here he is. We've been waiting for this moment to go into Jerusalem. Now remember last week we talked about, he said he was going, he was waiting for the right time to go back to Jerusalem. And so he knew that at Passover time, there would be more people to hear about the gospel of Jesus. So he was going to wait. I'm going to wait till it's time to go and then we'll go. So here he is walking in and it's Passover time. And do you know what Passover time means in the Jewish culture? At this moment when he walked in, there was over 2 million people there. 2 million people there. Verse 17. When he arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received, received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Verse 20, 
the very beginning part of 20, when they heard this, they praised God. So we're pausing right there as we see this reception. It is, what we do know is that the leadership had gathered together into Jerusalem church. And what does the leadership look like? Well, leadership is about knowing the estimation of the Sanhedrin council is around 70 elders. So that's going to be kind of intimidating for Paul walking into the Jewish church. And now there are 70 elders that are there in front of him. And Paul greeted as he greeted them, uh, felt warmth, right? So there was this in this giant group that was intimidating with all of his companions that were there. And as their their leader was James, known as James the Just. Now, if you know who James is, yes, the, the same James who authored the book of James, who is also the half-brother of Jesus. So this James was also the head of the council in the Jewish church at that time. And, and we do know the background of him. We've talked about this and understanding who James is in the past, too. We know that his his, he was known for his devotion to God. He was known for his devotion to prayer because of the calluses that were on his knees. He had giant calluses on his knees because he was constantly on his knees in prayer. That's the kind of person that James was. And so that would be a little intimidating walking up to someone with that type of passion for the Lord, right? So here Paul does these two things as he conducts uh, in this interview as they're, they're inquiring of him. So the first thing that we see is, is that uh, he, he shares the amazing things that God had done among the Gentiles. All right, so first off, right, we're going to Jerusalem, and the first thing he talks about is the Gentiles? Why not what God's been doing in the Jewish culture? You know, like, tickle their ears a little bit before you start talking about the, you know, the people that we don't want to hear about. That's, you know, that's the way Jerusalem was. They didn't, they didn't care for the Gentiles nearly as much. But here goes Paul doing what none of us would probably do. <laughs> here he's talking about the Ephesians riot, what happened when they came. He talked about the social impact of the gospel. He talked about the power of the gospel in Athens and also in Corinth. He talked about escaping assassins. He talked about the healing in Eutychus when he fell out the window. And all these different stories, here he is telling, hey, this is what the Lord has done. This is what God has done. And so the second thing he does, and Luke doesn't talk about it here specifically, but we do know that the primary reason that Paul wanted to go back was because he had this offering that all the, the people that were giving to the ministry, he wanted to give the offering to the Jerusalem church. And so his goal was to offer this, and it, he had taken this offering from the Gentiles. Now, again, going to the Jerusalem church, you're hearing, okay, um, so, so you're not real fond of us sharing the gospel with it, but here they are giving to the church. Are you willing to take their money? And so Paul was kind of wondering, are they going to really going to do this? Or, or is he, you know, affair, afraid that they're going to reject the offering that he had collected? And so Paul had hoped that it would bring some, some bonding together, like, you know, who's going to reject money, right? <laughs> but it was a relief when we did find out that Paul, uh, when Paul... Paul's offering was received in verse 20, and everything was going so well, and so it was, it was tough when Paul was later caught off guard, when the elders informed him of a problem. Look at the second half of verse 20. It's because we see the elders' suggestion as they share this in verse 20 to 25. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother... How many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are, are zealous for the law. They have been informed that they teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to their customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So, so what a reverse of what's taking place right now, right? Here they're talking about all these different wonderful things that are taking place, and, and they receive the offering. Oh, sure, we'll bring this. But they, we got an issue a little bit here. We're, they're telling us the, the teachings of the Jews to, they're telling us to forsake Moses. They're telling us to look at the Old Testament and reject the law. What, what are we to do with these people? So some of the believers in Jerusalem, uh, they believed mistakenly that Paul was teaching off-based teaching. So some of them have believed that this is what Paul was teaching. We know this is not what Paul taught. But they were mistakenly thinking and sharing misinformation. Whether they were doing it intentionally or not, we're not sure. But what isn't, doesn't matter is when misinformation 
information is being shared, it does detrimental work to the name of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't take much to spread a false rumor, but we never completely undo that type of wrong. As Christians, we must take this to heart. Be careful with the words that you share. See, Paul was accompanied by these non-Jewish believers, and the Jerusalem was, to, again, they were slow to accept these, these uh, Gentiles. They found it difficult to receive what, uh, remember what Peter was saying and, and the conversations that they had with Cornelius. But the Jew, Jewish church was suspicious of the work that had been done to the Samaritans. So again, Paul's talking about all this different work that had taken place. And so they're like, well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I mean, can he? Yeah. But, but does he? I don't know. Their response in verse 20 was basically saying, yeah, 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 we're, we're saved by grace, yeah. But we keep our salvation by keeping the law. We're saved by grace, but we keep that grace by following the law. So the Jerusalem church was, was compromised, right? So it, has very, it was very prejudiced at the time. And the sins were on the line. What they were dealing with was gossip. They were dealing with the, this rejection of Paul's teaching and twisting the story that made it look like it was, we were to be more zealous for the law. What does that look like? Legalism. Look in verse 23. The elder's suggestion came out like this. So, do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay for their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there is no truth in these reports about you but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. So here the elders are like, okay, all right. If this is right, then this is what we want you to do. So what this is, and you might think, all right, what is this like looking for different you know, expenses for these four men. Well, to give a background, in order for this, uh, they were taking a Nazarite vow. And we know that Paul had done this himself. So, you know, he's not afraid of a Nazarite vow. He's willing to do it. But what they're asking him to do was the value included abstaining from meat and wine and not to cut their hair for 30 days. So what Paul had to do was undergo a seven-day ritual of purification and pay for three animal offerings for each man plus food and plus their drinks offerings to take this vow. That's what they had to do. And so Paul was not, again, he wasn't against Nazarite vow because he had taken one himself. So it wasn't an unreasonable request. But however, when we look at it for first glance, we, we see that there was an exchange of favors here. Basically saying, paraphrasing verse 25, we have accepted this gift from the church, this, this abroad ident identifying ourselves as, as we're on with you on a Gentile mission. Now, Paul, if you will join these men and identify yourself openly to our nation, then we'll do it. So it portrayed him as being a part of the legalism that the Jewish church was putting out. There's no business for that. So this suggestion could cause this, this true religious politicking. This is where politics has no business being in the church. And this is where the politicking took place in the church. They're like, okay, we'll, we'll do what you want, but, but we want you to do what we want. I'll give to you as long as you give to me. No, no. For <laughs> third point, what does Paul do? Verse 26. Paul submits to the elders. Whoa. What? Look at verse 26. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice 
for the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Whoa. All right, so, so here's where it starts getting kind of in the weeds. Was Paul wrong for doing this? Was Paul wrong in, in setting up this, this, this going along with this type of legalism? I mean, it goes with what his guidance was when he spoke to in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look, look there, it's, it's on the, it'll be on the screen for you. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. To have, I have become all things to all people, so that by all, mean, by all possible means I might save some. Whoa. Now we'll tell you that that is probably the most difficult verse to memorize. Just <laughs> the way it reads, right? It's so funny how it reads. But to understand what is Paul's, why, why I say it's no, it's not sinning for what he did. Why? Why was he doing it? There's, there's the thing. Is it the deed that's wrong or is it the heart with the deed? What is Paul's motivation? I want to see others know Jesus. Amen. So that they may see Jesus. It was most certainly a beautiful, beautiful response. But many believe that, that, that he was sinning in this. And, and so they would hold like something like Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9 where it talks about uh, how the, regarding adding law to grace, right? So look at chapter uh, 1 of Galatians, verses 6 and 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Verse 9, as we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what we preached, let them be under God's curse. You see, in Galatians, there was a lot that had transpired. And, and you even think about how Peter was willing to go face to face with the Gentiles because of how they, he didn't like what they were eating. And so later it was explained that they no longer needed the law. And if you look in Galatians 3, verses 23 to 26, it says, Before the coming of this faith, we have held to in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed, so that the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian so in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. I know you might be thinking, like, we are getting awfully deep this morning. <laughs> this is important for us to understand and, and to grasp and, and to even wrestle through. 
wrestle through. Because in understanding this, you can understand both sides. In graduate school, I wrote a paper on this, right? So it's, it's, it's just food for thought to think through at what point is it grace? At what point is where does law come into grace, right? It's important to understand that. But in looking at all these different views, some might say that Paul was in error in going this because he's going against the very words that he preached to the Galatians, that it is, is all just faith. But where is the rest of it? Oh, wherever the view takes you, just understand this. It's best, not to, it's best to reserve the judgment onto where that is in place, but look at the evidence of the heart of the one who is doing it. Now, and so here's where it's tricky for us as humans, right? So we can't see each other's hearts. We can't see each other's motivations. At what point do we trust someone else's heart? In what way do we trust someone else's words? Where does that come into play with this? Well, look at what is Paul? Paul, could Paul see the elders' responses in this? Could he see what's the heart? What's your motivation in getting me to take this Nazarite vow and to pay for all these offerings? What's your motivation here? Guess what? He wasn't concerned about their motivation. He was concerned about his motivation. He was concerned about what his goal was, what he knew this revealed will that God had given him for these people was. Who else would go back to the Jerusalem church to preach the gospel? Who else? No one. No one. Everyone else that was in Paul's camp was like, don't go back. And he's like, no, 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 no. They need it. They need it. So I'm going to do that. So he went back, and he, because he had such love for the Jewish nation, he interpreted this, this song of praise for God as he, as he just, it just exuded the heart and response for this, this spiritual burden for Christ that he had for others. Look at Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. It says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasingly anguish in my heart, for I I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race. Do you, you hear his heart? His heart pursued Christ. His heart pursued these people for the sake of Christ. Paul is willing to be punished if it were meant that his brothers and sisters would be saved. You see, it's impossible for understand what he felt for this. And so we were going to just take a look at this love that he has and, and look at this beautiful picture of going back to the Jerusalem church as he shares with them his love for others. He doesn't care what it cost him because he looked at what it cost Christ. He had this incredible vision of bringing the church together, the Jews and the Gentiles, to be bonded in unity. A passion for unity is what the church is about. It's bringing people together for the cause of Christ. That's, what, that's why we gather. It's to bring people together for Jesus. And so Paul went with this elder suggestion because he loved the nation more than he loved his own life. Whoa. You mean it's not supposed to be my way? Paul didn't care. He cared so much about others, he was willing to take the burden. So what do we, how do we respond to this type of experience that Paul had walked through? Well, first thing I want us to look at is be careful of bad judgment. You see, trouble comes when, when our enthusiasm is blurred by poor judgment. It, that, that's, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. So be careful of bad judgment because we're, we're all susceptible to it. Second thing is, is do, don't be pressured by other sin. You see, we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world and our own sins and the sins of others around us sometimes make it difficult to know what is right. 
So we need to be gracious when our brothers and sisters make what we might even consider be wrong decisions, considering that not only their actions, but also their motivations. So be careful to not be pressured by others, but hold back your judgment because we want to look at their hearts. And then thirdly is, is to be willing to take risks for God's glory. I'm going to say that again. Be willing to take risks for God's glory. You see, some people's hearts never risk anything. They neither, they neither uh, for sin nor for righteous deeds. They kind of just sit on the sidelines. We talked about this last week a little bit. And we reserve the ability to make risky decisions for Christ because we don't want to make the wrong decision. Here's the thing. God works through decisions. So let's make a decision rather than just sitting and waiting to make a decision. You see, God's glory is worth taking a risk here on earth for. So as we conclude this chapter, we see the fourth thing of what takes place is God overrules the situation. And we see this picture of what takes place, right? The situation it had now gotten worse because of all of what Paul is saying and how it's being responded to and, and felt. But God delivers Paul. Look at verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the providence of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled the holy place. Verse 29. They had previously seen Trebotus and the, the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought them him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul and dragging him from the temple. And immediately the gates were shut. So in our, like, you can't imagine what kind of scene this is like and how this is just completely crazy. But God was in control of all of this. And in fact, he was protecting Paul. Verses 31 to 36, basically, it, you see this aroused decision of the crowd of saying, get rid of him. Get rid of him. So the soldiers poured into the, the uh, coming into the, from the tower, which was closest. And they all, there's like 200 of them come and, and they gather, which is a lot more than just the one centurion that you might think would be guarding Paul. The soldiers took Paul away from the crowd. So where's God intervened? He starts working through the soldiers of the Jerusalem church, right? So Paul, as he's being dragged out, he says, he asks for and was given permission to address the crowd. Look at verse 37. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, and uh, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek, he replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood at the steps and mentioned to the crowd when they were all silent, he spoke to them in Aramaic. So we're going to pick up next week what was being said. But just the fact of he is being torn and beaten and shredded by a group of people that are so against him and against what he is proclaiming. Yet his desire and love for this people is so evident. He says, please let me talk to them. Can you imagine? I mean, the guy was like, well, aren't you, aren't you this bad guy? The lady? He's like, no, 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 I'm Jewish. I'm actually from a pretty, pretty nice area that actually has permission to talk to these people. Just give me, give me permission. Just let me do it. 
And so that he does. What an amazing picture and, and, and that gives us his, this picture of him being beaten so terribly. One theologian wrote this, For a man with a heart like Paul's, depending as he did on the Almighty God of heaven, such an accomplishment is attainable. What does it cause to see this bleeding and broken apostle to ask permission to speak? You see, such people with a, a heart and passion for others. He didn't care what it cost him. You see, us as an American culture, to think that I don't care what it costs me, is a complete 180 from our culture. It's a complete 180. They're gonna, people are going to wonder, if we, are, if we had that type hearts that Christ calls us to have, to have a heart for others like that, what does that look like? It's a one who desires Christ more than anyone else. So our application this morning is very simple. Don't worry about making bad decisions so much as that we sit on the sidelines. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. Our theme this morning is this. A heart for Christ is moved with a burning love for others to know Jesus. Let's pray together.